First of all, thank you all for coming, and special thanks to Al Felsenberg and Deborah Williams for helping to organize this, among others. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mark McKinnon to you all. Mark is Global Vice Chairman of Hill and Knowlton Strategies, an international communications consultancy, and president of Maverick Media. During his career, he has helped engineer five winning presidential primary and general election campaigns, and in recent years has become a leading reformer co-founding, coaching, and working with organizations such as No Labels, Mayday, Counterpack, Take Back Our Republic, and Freedom to Marry campaign. Additionally, McKinnon has received more than 30 Polly and Telly Awards honoring, honoring him as the nation's best political and public affairs advertiser. He's also worked for many other causes, companies, individuals, and candidates ranging from George W. Bush to Bono and most recently has served as an advisor to HBO's critically acclaimed series, The Newsroom. McKinnon and Julian Castro, HUD secretary, serve as co-chairs of Southerners for the Freedom to Marry. In 2014, McKinnon launched Mayday Pack to force ethics reform in the United States Congress, along with Harvard law professor Larry Lessig and tech moguls Steve Wozniak, Fred Wilson, Peter Thiel, and Reid Hoffman. Mark began his career as a songwriter in Nashville, Tennessee, working alongside country's music legendary songwriter Chris Christopherson, one of my favorites. He returned to Texas to study at the University of Texas at Austin and was the editor of the student newspaper The Daily Texan. While working for The Daily Texan, he was jailed briefly on a First Amendment issue. McKinnon's first political campaign experience was volunteering for then-Texas Senator Lloyd Doggett's 1984 campaign. Uh, Paul Begala, a name you should know, who worked in the upper echelon of the campaign at the time, gave him his first break, moving him into the press office for Doggett's campaign. One of the things Mark is best known for, of all the things he's done, is he's known as the political advisor who walked away from U.S. Senator John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign because he chose not to embrace negative campaign tactics, an act described as being, quote, unheard of in the world of modern politics, where partisanship usually trumps principle as a matter of course, said uh, John Avalon in The Daily Beast. Today, Mark will be discussing the November 4th midterm congressional elections, what he thinks of the outcome, and what it means for President Barack Obama, as well as for the country. The title of his talk, which is being co-sponsored by the Penn Political Coalition, is the 2014 election returns, what they portend for the remainder of the Obama presidency and the run-up to 2016. Before I ask Mark to step up, I just want to let you know, many of you already do, that tomorrow from 2.30 to 4 p.m., uh, Mark will be holding open office hours so that students uh, can come in one-on-one -on -one or in small groups to talk with him about careers in public service or political consulting. That will be in room 230 of this building. So please join me in welcoming Mark McKinnon. Will I offend anybody if I use some Texas salty language? Bring it You're pissing on my leg, but it's warm and it feels good. <laughs> I'm going to take off my hat because my mother taught me to take it off indoors, but I'm going to tell you a hat story at the end of this. Uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about the elections, but I want to set up that discussion by talking about uh, what we do in politics and what people like me do and what we think about and how we craft campaigns, how we craft the messages of the campaigns. This will give you an idea about really behind the scenes, what, what people like Paul Begala and I do when we, when we go to work for a campaign. And uh, you mentioned Paul Begala, so let me just talk a little bit about Paul, because he, he, he and I put this together years ago. I've adapted it many times since then. But Paul, as some of you may know, is a Democratic strategist who helped elect Bill Clinton. Uh, Paul was at the University of Texas the same time I was, and by the way, let me just say how happy I am to be here. I love this turnout, uh, and, and so we're going to talk about a lot. We're going to talk about no labels. We're going to talk about what's happening in the political environment. We're going to cover a lot of ground, so I'll, I'll stay here as long as you like. 
Um, uh, but I'm also really happy to be here because one of my oldest and dearest friends is Kathleen Hall Jameson, who was, uh, we were together in Austin during the 80s, and she, and you should be, you, you probably know, but in our world, she is an icon. I mean, she is, you are so lucky to have her here, as well as Al Felsenberg, who's also an old dear friend uh, from, from many years of politics. So, I mean, you, to be at, the, I, I wish I could come back and go to school here. This is just, it's such a great facility, and you have such great, great people working here and such great experience. And I mean, you've got the highest level of uh, public policy and politics here to, to kind of let you know what's going on. Uh, so uh, Paul was the, uh, I was the editor of the, of, the daily, of, the, of the student newspaper. Paul was an aspiring student politico. And uh, we really screwed up his plans when we had a referendum and abolished student government. So. Uh, uh, Paul, as a response to that, had another effort to, uh, a second effort to resurrect student government, which was successful, and then as we predicted, he turned around and ran for student body president. So in order to get back at Paul, we had a cartoon strip with a character named Hank the Hallucination. So we ran Hank against Paul, and Hank beat Paul. But as a, as a early sign of Paul's considerable political skills, he took the cartoonist out to lunch the next day, bought a pitcher of beer, and we woke up the next morning and discovered Hank had been assassinated in the cartoon strip, <laughs> and Paul thereby acceded to the presidency. <laughs> True story. So we're, Paul's going to come up again. But uh, after working for Bill Clinton, he came and worked at a firm that I helped start in Austin, Texas, years ago called Public Strategies. And we sat down, this is 15 years ago or so, at one point, and we said, you know, we talk a lot about message in politics and how important it is. And if any of you work in the corporate world, this is very similar to discussions about brand. You hear a lot of talk about brand. Brand is to corporate sort of advertising and positioning as messaging is to politics. But we realize that very often, especially in losing campaigns, we, we discovered that either halfway through the campaign or worse yet at the end of the campaign, the candidate and the campaigns really didn't know what we were talking about. They said, yeah, we get well, this message thing, but what is it? What is message? What, what is a successful message all about? What are you talking about? And it was a great point that we had failed in our job to really instill in the candidates and the campaigns themselves what it is, what are the fundamentals of a message. And so we said, well, let's, let's, let's review all the successful campaigns we've done and the losing campaigns and figure out what are the commonalities of the things that work or don't. And so we put together this presentation. As I said, I've kind of adapted it over the years because things change, too. The uh, politics, like, like other markets, evolve. They adapt and they evolve. Uh, and one of the fascinating things I did when I first did the 2000 presidential campaign is I went back and, and looked at all the advertising back to the very beginning of television advertising. And what's fascinating is, and I have a whole other presentation I do on this, but just to watch and see how the advertising and the messaging evolves over time and adapts to that market. It really changes precisely and definitively over time and, and, get, and is very different. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that because we have some examples of some great presidential advertising here. Um, some classic, some of the great old Reagan and LBJ ads. Uh, so uh, this is, the, this is a, a presentation that we have done for, Paul and I have done for presidents, governors, senators, uh, but it also applies across the board. It's not, it, if you're working for an NGO, any effort which is seeking to communicate, this applies. And so almost any enterprise you're going to be involved in has a public communication function, whether you're an NGO or a business a nonprofit, whatever it is. So these lessons all apply. It's specific to campaigns in this presentation, but it, it equally applies to whatever effort you're trying to communicate for. So first of all, what's the most important thing? A rationale. What's your rationale? Why are you running? Why do you have your business? What are you here for? Why are you doing what you're doing? That seems so simple and obvious that you wouldn't have to state it, but think about... Uh, if you look at the campaigns that are unsuccessful or businesses that fail, very often at the core of that is a lack of a clear rationale. Okay, so I'm just going to give you, at the end of the day, the most fundamental thing is if you can't answer that question, you're in big trouble. And make sure you answer that question in a clear and compelling way. So here's an example of a failure to articulate a clear rationale. 1979, Jimmy Carter, so weak as an incumbent president that his own party wants to run somebody against him because they think that Carter will not be able to win the presidency, and sure enough, he didn't, his re-election. So the smart, wise people said, we need to, we need to primary our own president, which is a, 
uh, pretty unheard of, but it just testifies to how weak Carter was. And the, and the guy was Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy was the guy for, for a, a, a lot of logical reasons. He, he, was, he was ready and he was ready to run. But he had one big problem, an incident called Chappaquiddick uh, involving alcohol. He drove off a bridge. Young woman lost her life. Very tragic situation. Happened many years before, but they knew it would be relitigated when he ran for president. And so they developed a strategy. And it was a good strategy. They said, let's, rather than have months of you know, dozens and dozens of different stories and takes on this, let's do one big story, give it as an exclusive to a, the most credible organization in the country at the time, 60 Minutes. It'll be tough, it'll be hard, but it'll be done. We can, after that, we can say, sorry, we did 60 Minutes. You know, if that's not enough for you, sorry. And that was a really, a really good idea. So they briefed up Kennedy for weeks, figured out every possible question they might get. Uh, they go into the interview. It's, on, it's up at Hyannis Port. Uh, so two hours in, and he's knocking it out of the park, every question, just beautifully. And then literally at the end of the interview, as they're winding down, the reporter asks, as an afterthought, really not even intended to be part of the interview, but so why do you want to be president? Boom. Deer in the headlights, frozen, and you know he's going, damn it, we didn't go over that one. <laughs> and watch what happens. Because really what he's being asked is the basic question. What's your rationale for running? Watch what happens. Why do you want to be president? Come on, come on. Well, I'm, um, <laughs> were I to, to make the, uh, the announcement and uh, to run, the reasons that I would run is because I have a great belief in this country that it is as more natural resources than any nation of the world, as the greatest educated population in the world, the greatest technology of any country in the world, uh, the greatest capacity for innovation in the world, and the greatest political system in the world. Okay, so, pathetic, right? But worse than that, worse than that, I mean, worse than the fact they didn't have a, 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 a he didn't have a clear rationale prepared about why he wanted to run. Break down what he did say. Generally in politics, you have a dynamic of incumbent versus, uh, uh, status quo versus change, right? If, if you're in the incumbent, you're trying to articulate a, a rationale to maintain the status quo. If you're challenging, your message is all about change. What does he say? Now, great natural resource, great education, everything's great, and therefore, re-elect Jimmy Carter. That's Jimmy Carter's message. You know, so not only did he, not articulate a good rationale for his own candidacy, he articulated a good rationale to elect the other guy. Here's a guy who thought about it a little bit more. Every time I speak about my hope for America, the cynics in Washington roll their eyes. You see, they don't believe we can actually change politics and bring an end to decades of division and deadlock. They don't believe we can limit the power of lobbyists who block our progress, or that we can trust the American people with the truth. And that's why we face the same problems and hear the same promises every four years. My experience tells me something very different. In 20 years of public service, I've brought Democrats and Republicans together to solve problems that touch the lives of everyday people. I've taken on the drug and insurance companies and won. I defied the politics of the moment and opposed the war in Iraq before it began. This is Barack Obama. I approve this message to ask you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington. I'm asking you to believe in yours. Wow. It's a reason that guy was elected, right? That's fantastic. That's as good as it gets in politics. Clear, compelling rationale. Great campaigns also tell a story. What does that mean? Well, in, in our culture, we are, we are attracted to storyline, to narrative. We are in film, in music, books. Same thing goes for campaigns. If you can tell a story, create a narrative architecture, and not just a bunch of information, but why is this important? What's the storyline to it? Great campaigns have a storyline. So how do we articulate to, that to candidates or campaigns? We break it down like this. We have a filter. We say, establish a threat and or an opportunity. There's something out there that is threatening the lives of people, or there's an opportunity that's being denied to people. You're running to make it better or to make it less worse, all right? 
So you identify the threat or the opportunity out there. Otherwise, if you're not running to do something, you're not going to get any support anyway. So you're running to either amplify the opportunity or diminish the threat. Who are the victims of the threat? Who is it out there that's having the denied opportunity or upon whom the threat's being imposed? Who are the victims? Identify a villain. Who is who or what? It can be a bureaucracy. It can be a... It doesn't have to be a person. It can be. But there's something out there that's imposing the threat or denying the opportunity. Establish a solution. Then you have your hero. Solution hero. Threat opportunity, victim, villain, resolution hero. That's kind of a classic narrative arc. And if you break it down like that and you look at really great campaigns, generally you'll see the, some form of that. And I'll show you some examples there. So here's my favorite example of that in what I think is the, the second best American political ad ever made. There, there's, there may be debate about that. There's no debate over the number one ad, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. But this, this I think, is the number two ad. Um, and this is uh, the Bear in the Woods ad. Uh, and so this is a 1984. Uh, this articulates perfectly in 28 seconds the narrative arc that I just described. And there's only a few of us in the room who are old enough to remember, but at the time, the bear was a well-recognized metaphor for the Soviet Union. So people got that right away, okay? So now think about that arc, what I was talking about, the threat. There is a bear in the woods. For some people, the bear is easy to see. Others don't see it at all. Some people say the bear is tame. Others say it's vicious and dangerous. Since no one can really be sure who's right, isn't it smart to be as strong as the bear? If there is a bear. Perfect. Not a wasted breath. That architecture I just talked about, the threat, victim, villain, resolution, hero. By the way, I, I ran into uh, uh, the campaign manager for that campaign about a year ago, and I was talking about this ad, and he said, he said, yeah, that, that bear, it cost $10,000 to rent that bear. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no kidding. He said, yeah. He said, watch carefully. We didn't back up the film. He backed up. We taught him to back up. <laughs> That's a good bear and a hell of an investment. So one of the great challenges that we have uh, in this information age in which we're barraged with just millions of bits of information every day is that our opportunity, our window to communicate is so narrow. And just to give you a sense of how narrow that is, in 1968 when Richard Nixon ran for president, on average, on the evening news, if he did a press conference, a speech, whatever it might be, on average he'd get 48 seconds of time. 48 seconds. Doesn't seem like that much, but it was 48 seconds. The last election, the average amount of time the president, candidates for president got on TV, seven seconds. So that leaves us in a position as counselors to whoever we're working with to say, OK, Mr. Congressman, Mrs. Senator, whoever it is, you're going to do your climate change press conference tomorrow, and you have seven seconds to communicate your message. And very often, the response to that is, well, that's ridiculous. I'm a really smart person. This is a really complicated subject, and I'm not going to dumb it down which is exactly what Bill Clinton said to Paul Begala in 1991, early 92, as they're preparing for debates. And um, they were talking about the balanced budget amendment, a big issue at that time, and Clinton went on for 25 minutes, and Paul finally said, Governor, you don't have 25 minutes, you have three. Not seven seconds, but three. And Clinton said, oh, it's impossible, I can't possibly communicate this. <laughs> I can't do it, Paul. <laughs> and so this kind of went back and forth, and Clinton, and Clinton said, you know, show me an example of a, a complicated subject like this articulated in the way that you're describing. And Paul said, okay, you're on. And he pulled out a small pocket-sized Bible that he bought on the drag in Austin. And for all I know, he still carries it around. And he opened it to John 3.16. Can somebody Google John 3.16 for me? You got the Google here? And just raise your hand when you've got it. Anybody got it? OK. As soon as somebody has it, you got it? 
Okay, so now what I'm going to ask you to do is to read it. And this is what Paul Begala asked Clinton to do. He said, okay, Governor, read that for me. So go ahead, just read it out loud. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Boom, okay. So that's exactly what Clinton did, and here's how Paul responded. He said, there, Governor, in 25 words lasting 6.8 seconds, St. John has listed all the essentials of Christian theology, all of them, in seven seconds. <laughs> Let me break it down for you, Governor. For God, monotheism, not the gods, just God. It took humanity hundreds of thousands of years to come to the conclusion there's only one supreme being. John 3.16 covers all that ground in two words and a fraction of a second. So love the world. God is not only singular and supreme, but also benevolent, capable of affection on a global scale. He, God's a guy. If that offends you, take it up with the author. Gave his only begotten son. Okay, he's got a son, a begotten one at that, willing to ship him to earth as a gift, an enormously complicated concept, fraught with ramifications, but delivered in just five words. So that whoever believes in him, having faith in the son as a prerequisite to what comes next, shall not die but have everlasting life. That's the payoff. Faith triumphs over everything, even death. That's why believers call this the good news. Now, Again, for some of the older folks in the audience, remember at big football games, the guy who used to show up with the uh, uh, rainbow afro, right, and the John, the sign, John 3.16 sign. Well, here's the modern-day equivalent. This is Tim Tebow, and he has some thoughts on this day, which was the national championship. His thoughts are, I think we're going to win this game, and when we win, I'm going to be on TV, and when I get on TV, I want to send a message that has nothing to do with football. So what does he do? John 3.16 in his eye black. Because he knows people are going to see that and go, what the hell is that? Google, John 3.16, boom, seven seconds, got it. And Clinton said, okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> and went on to be a Hall of Fame communicator and president of the United States. But this, because he was able to figure out how to articulate those complicated messages. Emotion is a, is a key. We, we tend to, in sort of public policy and politics, get pretty wound around the axle around data and statistics and facts and fail to remember that it's much more compelling to tell a human story, to tie some emotion, to package it with emotion. Um, and so uh, you just, whenever you're communicating, step back and think, how can we communicate this in a human way? How can we tell a story that has some emotion involved in it? Here's a couple of examples. The first is John McCain. McCain's message in his campaign was country first. Uh, and I was involved in the primaries, as you mentioned. And just to put a little more detail on that, what had happened was two years before that election, uh, I, John McCain and I had a discussion about working for him. I said I had met Obama. Uh, I liked him. I disagreed with a lot of his politics, but I thought his candidacy would be good for the country. But even back, but back then, nobody thought he was going to win the nomination. But I said to McCain, I, in fact, I wrote in a memo just in case anybody forgot, which they did. Uh, I said, you know, proud to go to work for you, but in the, in the event that this guy, Senator Obama from, from Illinois, gets elected as the nominee, and you are, I, would, I, I think it would be better for me to just step out of the general election campaign. And then, of course, that, that happened, and, uh, and, and McCain was very good about it. He said, you know, hugged me and said, thanks for, first of all, he did forget. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. And then he said, thanks for helping me get here, and it would be very un-McCain-like not to keep your word, so I stepped out. But, Anyway, in the primary, uh, McCain, McCain has this amazing story uh, about, about being a POW, and you may know that much about him. He was shot down, and he was, he was uh, held as a prisoner of war for years uh, in, in Vietnam. What you may not know, which is sort of key to the story, is that because he was an admiral's son, and they knew that, and he was very famous, it was a huge PR coup for them to have him, and they, were, they wanted to let him go and get this big PR coup out of it, but McCain refused. And this was at a time when it wasn't clear his, his fellow inmates thought he was going to die because he was, he was so badly injured, and McCain refused. He said, no, I live by the code, first in, first out, no preferential treatment for me. So we found this, this documentary French communist film footage in a box from when he was in, when, right after he'd been shot down. And we said, Senator, we got to, this is so compelling. And he said, no way, you can't use it. And he just had this thing about not exploiting his war effort. He didn't like the fact that he's smoking a cigarette in it. He didn't like the fact that he looks very vulnerable, you'll see. And, and I, so I'm going to get to this point a little bit later. 
But, you know, there's this notion we want our candidates to be perfect. Well, I argue that increasingly in this day and age, what you want is some authenticity. You show these are real people because people just don't believe politics anymore. They don't believe what people tell them. So I said, Senator, we've got to show this. And we almost had to break his arm again to do it, but we, we did. Uh, so the, there's that. And then, that, then it will segue to a, a, an ad called the Ashley ad, which was shown in Ohio in 2008, 2004, which was arguably instrumental in winning that race in Ohio, which was a critical state. Uh, and just watch the emotional content of it, but also think about that narrative architecture that I described. How old are you? 31. What uh, is your rank in the Army? Lieutenant Commander in the Navy. Hit by either a missile or any aircraft fire. I'm not sure which. I ejected it and broke my leg and both arms. And your official number? 624787. One man sacrificed for his country. One man opposed a flawed strategy in Iraq. One man had the courage to call for change. One man didn't play politics with the truth. One man stands up to the special interests. Stand up. We're Americans. We're Americans, and we'll never surrender. They will. One man does what's right, not what's easy. John McCain. I'm John McCain, and I approve this message. My wife, Wendy, was murdered by terrorists on September 11th. The Faulkner's daughter, Ashley, closed up emotionally. But when President George W. Bush came to Lebanon, Ohio, she went to see him, as she had with her mother four years before. He walked toward me, and I said, Mr. President, this young lady lost her mother in the World Trade Center. And he turned around, and he came back, and he said, I know that's hard. Are you all right? Our president took Ashley in his arms and just embraced her. And it was at that moment that we saw Ashley's eyes fill up with tears. He's the most powerful man in the world, and all he wants to do is make sure I'm safe, that I'm OK. What I saw was what I want to see in the heart and in the soul of the man who sits in the highest elected office in our country. Progress for America Voter Fund is responsible for the content of this message. So I mentioned this notion of authenticity. This, this is a section that I've added recently. I talked about how it evolves. It's so difficult in politics anymore to communicate anything because voters, rightly so, and who can blame them, don't believe anything you tell them. I mean, when you've got $4 billion being spent, much of it anonymously, uh, uh, by special interests, it's certainly understandable why people are so skeptical about what they see or they hear. So, uh, as communicators, we try and find ways in which to, to do something to, to uh, make the candidates authentic and real human beings. And I, I'll just give you an example of this. In 2000, when we produced a film to show at the convention, uh, and this would be the first time many people in America would see George W. Bush, other than those who'd been you know, sort of focused on the primaries, which is not the broad, broader country. We were shooting the film for that. And I was interviewing the president and Mrs. Bush. And I was asking them about when their daughters were born. He told the story about being in the, in the delivery room together with them. And he just completely garbled what he was trying to say. And they laughed. And we said, OK, let's go back. And we did it a few more times until we got it perfectly. When we got into the edit room, we got to that point, And there was that, the, the screw up. And we said, OK, cut that. And then I said, no, wait a minute. Let's leave it in. Why? Because it was a, it was a real moment. And it was, and it was funny. You know, it was him kind of stepping all over what he was trying to say. But also, to, you know, we sort of said, let's not raise the bar of expectations on this guy. <laughs> you know, which is important, too. You know, uh, th this is going to happen more than once. So let's not surprise anybody. And you can't imagine the fight that I had with the campaign over this, you know, to leave in a mistake. But we won, and it was a, it was a really... You know, it was just a human moment, and people liked it. And even people that didn't agree with his policy just said, you know, he's, he's a good and decent guy. Uh, so this, this, this moment I want to show you right now, I think, really testifies to the power of authenticity. 2008, uh, Obama wins uh, Iowa, big upset. And as often happens, suddenly that kind of falls over into New Hampshire, 
which is the second, first primary state, second caucus, then primary state. But you roll up Iowa and New Hampshire, you're pretty much done if you can win both those first two uh, contests. And Obama won, and then suddenly it was like, he's up double digits in New Hampshire. And looked like he was going to win it easily and that the primary was going to be over early. Then literally a day before the, the, the election, then it's still like, you know, look at the polls, it's 15-point spread. And then this happens. And this is simply a moment on the campaign trail where Hillary Clinton kind of drops her facade uh, and has a very human, vulnerable moment. You know, she's tired, she's probably a little sick, completely worn out. She gets asked kind of a softball question by somebody in a town hall meeting. But listen to it. And I remember when this happened, and I remember first reporters tweeting up, oh, God, Hillary Clinton cried. You know, this is the end of the campaign. And I saw the video, and I said, I don't, I, I think this is exactly what people wanted to see. You know, it'd been up until then, it had been sort of the machine, the inevitable candidacy. And then suddenly the curtain opens up, and we see this human being. And listen to the rationale. How do you keep upbeat and and so wonderful. Um, it's a tough question. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, and, and I couldn't do it if I just didn't, you know, passionately believe it was the right thing to do. You know, I have so many opportunities from this country. I just don't want to see us fall backwards. You know, so... You know, this, this is very personal for me. It's not just political. It's not just public. I see what's happening. And we have to reverse it. And some people think elections are a game. They think it's like who's up or who's down. It's about our country. It's about our kids' futures. And it's really about all of us together. You know, some of us put ourselves out there and do this against some pretty difficult odds. And we do it, each one of us, because we care about our country. 24 hours later, she wins New Hampshire. And then we have extended primaries almost through May. It was through May. It was into June, wasn't it? So relevancy is another key. So often, this is kind of often overlooked. Why is it relevant to your audience that they do something, that they act in a certain way? So this is the most famous ad in American history. Anybody venture a guess? The Daisy ad, the Daisy ad right. <laughs> Uh, as I said, you ask a thousand political consultants what the best ad, you'll get a thousand daisies. <laughs> Deservedly so. So the situation is that uh, it's, it's kind of later in the campaign. Polls come out and are published in newspapers that suggest that not only is Johnson ahead, but will probably win decisively. Most campaigns would have like gone and popped the champagne with that news. The Johnson campaign really smartly said, this is a problem. Why? because all their supporters just got the message that this thing's basically done, so why should I vote? They thought it would have a suppressing effect on their turnout, and they were probably right. So they very smartly said, we have to elevate the stakes. And in fact, the last line of the ad says, the stakes are too high for you to stay home. And they create this genius ad, and it's genius because of its creativity, and I've seen it a million times, and it still blows me away. But that, the brilliance of the creative often overlooks the brilliance of the strategy, which was to make sure that people knew that it was important for them to go out and vote. Otherwise, you might get this nutball who you know, have a quick finger on the nuclear trigger. The daisy ad. Whoa. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. Here we go. Either love each other 
or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Vote or die. <laughs> Pretty relevant. Pretty relevant. So, uh, again, I've talked about the narrow opportunities you have to communicate in a campaign. So you've got to make sure that every time you do, you're consistent and clear with your rationale and your message. So I'm going to show you an example of uh, John Kerry, who really mixed his message up and, gave, and created opportunities for us to, to communicate to people that you, know, you just don't know where this guy stands. He just has no clear vision of where he wants to go or what he wants to do. Uh, and that was a very tough re-election for George Bush. Less than 50% of the people liked him, less than 50% supported his policies. But in the end, people preferred the, the, a guy that they knew versus a guy that they weren't, had no idea what he was going to do. Uh, and then we'll shift to, once again, to the Hall of Fame, Bill Clinton, showing, it how, showing you how it should be done. The right decision to disarm Saddam Hussein. And when the president made the decision, I supported him. I don't believe the president took us to war as he should have. The winning of the war was brilliant. It's the wrong war in the wrong place at the wrong time. I have always said we may yet even find weapons of mass destruction. I actually did vote for the $87 billion before I voted against it. So that created an opportunity, especially when we got some film footage of John Kerry windsurfing off the coast of Nantucket in some purple board shorts recognizing there's not a lot of people who windsurf in America, that this would seem pretty disconnected from their lives, and kind of made the point we were trying to make. Which direction would John Kerry lead? Kerry voted for the Iraq War, opposed it, supported it, and now opposes it again. He bragged about voting for the $87 billion to support our troops before he voted against it. He voted for education reform and now opposes it. He claims he's against increasing Medicare premiums, but voted five times to do so. John Kerry, whichever way the wind blows. We do not need to build a bridge to the past. We need to build a bridge to the future. And that is what I commit to you to do. Do not let us resolve to build that bridge to the 21st century. Let us build a bridge to help our parents raise their children. Let us resolve to build that bridge. I ask all of our fellow citizens to join me and to join you in building that bridge to the 21st century. I want to build a bridge to the 21st century, and all Americans will have the knowledge they need to cross that bridge to the 21st century. Do we want to weaken our bridge to the 21st century? I want to build a bridge to the 21st century. I want to build a bridge to the 21st century. My fellow Americans, if we're going to build that bridge to the 21st century, we have to make our children free. I want to build a bridge to the 21st century. I want to build a bridge to the 21st century. These are the things that we must do to build that bridge to the 21st century. I want to build a bridge to the 21st century. Our bridge to the future must include bridges to other nations. We can only build our bridge to the 21st century. And if we're willing to walk arm in arm across that bridge together, if we want to build that bridge to the 21st century, we have to be willing to say loud and clear, I'm building that bridge to the 21st century. The real choice is whether we will build a bridge to the future or a bridge to the past. Let us commit ourselves this night to rise up and build the bridge we know we ought to build all the way to the 21st century. OK? The master. <laughs> now, the setup on that was that the, the Republicans and Bob Dole had gone a couple of weeks beforehand. And there was kind of this big focus on the good old days when you could kind of leave your keys in your car and neighbors could help one another out. And it was kind of very past-oriented. And so they smartly said, let's make this the future versus the past. And now, I, I, they knew that it, you know, if you were in the hall, that was going to be a little ridiculous. I mean, it was 22 times in one speech. But they, were, they knew everybody in the hall was for them already. They wanted to ensure that everybody who wasn't in the hall or saw the speech opened the newspaper the next day and said, saw the message. 
And if that's all he said, and you're a reporter, what do you report? <laughs> that's all he said. There's no way you could miss that, right? So that was their insurance to make sure that they got their message out. Just say it, you know, 22 times in 45 minutes. And sure enough, that was the message. And sure enough, it worked. Message discipline is the art of getting to your core message no matter what the, the question is. You'll see people do this very artfully in debates. I'm reminded of that 1984 campaign with Lloyd Doggett, and he was running against Phil Graham in 84, which is a huge Republican year. But he had a b big upset win in the primary. And James Carville was working with Doggett, and, and the message focus that James wanted was on Social Security and Phil Graham's bad record on Social Security, that if he got elected, he was going to cut Social Security benefits for older Texans. But Lloyd, being a trial lawyer, would you know, answer whatever question was asked and rarely talk about Social Security. And then finally, James comes in and he goes, he got it, he got it, he got it, he finally got it. And he said, what happened? He said, well, it turns out this was on the day that the Marine barracks were blown up and like 70-something Marines were killed in Lebanon. And a reporter asked Lloyd about it, and he, he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I think this is a terrible tragedy. I feel horrible for the victims, but I'm also really concerned about their surviving relative Social Security benefits that will get cut if Phil Graham gets elected. <laughs> so that's an example of kind of pulling it back to make sure you get your message. This is an example from sports, which is why I like it. It's got a little bit of that same kind of Tebow thing. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the point here is this is a guy who's just – just won the heavyweight boxing championship of his life. And if you've ever boxed for more than one minute, it's like the most grueling physical thing you can imagine. Uh, and a reporter jumps in the ring, and, and this is something he's been pursuing all his life to win the championship. But like Tebow, he's got something else he wants to talk about. Just listen to him, ignore what the reporter says, and keep focused on what he wants to talk about. That's one of the biggest surprises in boxing I ever had. Well, you know, I, I get glory to God, and for everybody to know that, you can't choose against God. You can choose against me any time, but when God is involved, Jesus is alive, and, and he the credit for it, and I, and I thank God. And why, I, why did you guarantee it with such assurance? Well, because, you know, when, you, when any time somebody put God up there, my, my God is the only true God, and, and anything must bow to God. Well... I, you know, apart from that, apart from religion, because God is here, I hope for all of us. I hope it's, it's, it's just God. Let's get off that. Let's get on the boxing. How did you fight such a brilliant fight? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I'm led by the Spirit of God. Like I told everybody, whatever the Spirit lead me to do, that's what I would do. And it wasn't nothing that so much that I did. And everybody knew that I would wash up. But with God, I'm not washed up. Did you see, did you see him getting tired? Did you think you could take him on at the end? It, it, went, about, it went about tired. It was about what the Lord wanted me to do, and, and each and every round, I went and I down, I fought competitive each round. I wasn't giving up anything. I went to the, went to the point to take one round at a time, and, and you know, I realized how competitive he was, and he caught me with a good shot, but yeah, I thank God for allowing me as up. So those are the fundamentals, and finally, we just, we really emphasize, after going through all that, all that goes out the window, unless you are really prepared. Preparation is key. And so here's what happens when you're not prepared. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. <laughs> Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. Five. Oh, five. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> commerce, education, and uh, the um, um, uh, EPA. EPA. There you go. No, again. Let's talk. Let's talk deposition. Seriously. Uh, is EPA the one you were talking about? Or? No, sir. No, sir. We were talking about the. Um, agencies of government. EPA needs to be rebuilt. But There's you no can't. Doubt about but you that. can't name the third one. The third agency of government, yeah. I would I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, <laughs> commerce. I, I, commerce, and let's see, I can't. The third one, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Europe. Okay, so uh, that's really painful to watch, isn't it? I mean, it's jeez. Oh. oh man, it's just so. It, in the spirit of bipartisanship, here is a counterpart of Rick Perry's in Texas, a guy named Kirk Watson, who was a mayor of Austin, a state senator, who is as good as you get generally on these sort of things. He's, a, he's great on his feet. He understands message. But he, he had an instance, a bad one, 
where he failed to prepare. And this, he got a question that he should have been prepared for and he wasn't, and here are the consequences. A big uh, Barack supporter, right, Senator? I am, yes, I am. Well, name some of his legislative accomplishments. We, uh, no, of, Senator, I want you to name some of Barack Obama's well, legislative accomplishments tonight, if you can. Well, you know, uh, what I will talk about is more about what he's offering to the American No, no, what has he accomplished, sir? He, you he say you support him. Tonight. Sir, you have to give me his accomplishments. You've supported him for president. You're on national television. Well, name I, his legislative accomplishments, Barack Obama, sir. Well, I, I'm not going to be able to name you specific you name items, any? items of legislative Can you name anything he's accomplished as a congressman? No, I'm not going to be able to do that tonight. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Well, I... I well, no, I don't. I don't think it is because I think one of the things that, that Senator Obama does is he inspires. Not even the person that's here to speak on behalf of Barack Obama can list his legislative accomplishments. I have worked with Senator Clinton in well, and well, around the issue. Talk, but let's talk about. But let's talk about. Well, I, I want to stop and allow you to have the, the opportunity to that, list the accomplishments, sir. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. One of the things that that she does, for example, on health care. She offers that and, and indicates that she's no, offering No, we're not talking about her accomplishments. We're talking, you're supposed is, to be talking about it. Okay, I'm going to have to cut this off because I've been told to, but Senator, well, can you give me one more shot? <laughs> List Barack Obama's accomplishments as a U.S. Senator now. <laughs> Brutal. Brutal. And you could hear, I mean, he was going to keep going, but you hear what he said at the end? He said, I'm cutting you off because my producer should tell me to stop. But I mean, I mean, that was just brutal and, you know, really pretty unfair. But, uh, but you know, at the same time, it was a question that he should have been prepared to answer. And, and, and so one last little clip here. You co-sponsored a bill requiring the display of the Ten Commandments in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Mm -hmm. Why was that important to you? Well, the Ten Commandments is, is not a bad thing uh, for people to understand and to respect. I'm with you. Where better place could you have something like that than in a judicial building mm -hmm. or in a courthouse? That is a good question. Can you think of any better building to put the Ten Commandments in than in a public building? No. I think if we were totally without them, we may lose a sense of our direction. What are the Ten Commandments? Well, all of them. You want me to name them yeah, all? Yeah, please. Um, don't lie. Don't, lie. Mm -hmm. don't steal. Um, don't steal. I can't name them all. So the other bit of advice is don't do Stephen Colbert <laughs> or Chris Matthews. Um, so uh, those are the kind of things that we, we think about uh, when, uh, when working with campaigns. And so as you kind of watch campaigns develop, think about some of these things. You know, are, are they applying these lessons or are they not? And I think often you'll see that when they're successful, they are, and when they're not, they don't. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the current environment and uh, projecting a little bit what this, these elections mean. Um, you know, we could spend hours talking about the political environment as it is uh, and, and why it is, and it's a fascinating subject. Uh, but the reality is that uh, it's, it's pretty broken. Uh, the, the, the public policy machinery of Washington is paralyzed by hyperpartisanship, uh, and that, that's all an evolution of uh, uh, cable TV, talk radio, evolution of internet technology, Citizens United, uh, you know, Supreme Court decision that allowed this sort of anonymous free spending. There's all sorts of things, and, and that's a whole subject unto itself. But, and, and people make credible arguments that there are other times in our history when we've had very partisan struggles, which is true. But I don't think that, I, I, I think it's not debatable that this is the most hyper-partisan environment that we've ever faced, and uh, it has real consequences. So I've spent uh, a good deal of, of the last years uh, working on different reforms to try and heal the breach. Uh, one of them specifically is no labels. 
which is now about five years old, which was, uh, which we, uh, uh, the, the mission behind that is simply, and it's evolved over time, by the way. Initially, my notion was that there was not a voice representing the sort of middle of American politics, which is where I describe myself and I think a lot of my friends, uh, but it's not represented in Congress. And the, but then we quickly realized that, you know, if, if our organization was going to be all about su supporting the centrists in Congress, we'd be talking about, oh, five or ten people. <laughs> Because, and it's, by the way, there's a fascinating National Journal graphic that was circulated a little while ago. Maybe I could pop it up. But uh, it shows what has happened over the last 20 years in terms of the overlap. And 20 years ago, the overlap was like, and when I say overlap, there were, there were uh, liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats who overlapped in their ideology. And 20 years ago, there were 270 of them that overlapped. Now, four. Four. Again, this gets into the whole issue of redistricting and how does this happen, but lots of interesting issues there as well. Uh, so, uh, it, so I'm working on a lot of reform efforts uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, the Mayday Pack and uh, others that address money in politics, which I think is a huge, huge problem. Uh, so working on those, but then the, the no labels effort, which has uh, evolved, as I said, because we recognize that that the Congress is divided, as is much of the country, and that in order to make anything work and to, and to problem solve, we had to get people of unlike ideologies together in the same room. And it was, it was pretty interesting that, for example, our, our until recently co-chair Joe Manchin, uh, now Joe Lieberman, but uh, Manchin had been in the Senate for two years from West Virginia, a Democrat. He said, I've never met with a Republican. Two years. You know, never actually met, had a formal meeting with Republicans. So our, our, our mission was simply to say, let's, we have to start rebuilding trust between the parties. And so we created a forum where we could, where we, our mission was to try and get people who disagreed and in these ideological wars together. And so uh, I'm happy to say that uh, despite, and in much, uh, and, and largely because of what's happening in Washington, we're actually making some progress. And we have 94 members of Congress now who've signed up for No Labels. Uh, and they've been getting some work done. They've been, you know, in three months, they wrote 17 pieces of legislation. Uh, and, but the, a fascinating thing happened. Uh, you know, it was such a low bar to say, look, can we just get in the same room together? Uh, but it's amazing to see what happens, because when they get to know each other, it's much harder to demonize one another when you actually know the people and understand that while you may not agree with their politics particularly, at least you're not questioning their motives. You know, most people have the same general motives about improving the lives of the constituents. You just have disagreement about how to get there. And so there's a, a number of other things we're doing there, which is trying to, you know, okay, first get in the room, see if we can establish some trust, see if we can get, articulate some very fundamental goals about the future. John Huntsman, who is our other co-chair, has spent a lot of time living overseas. He was an ambassador to China and Saigon uh, and, and one other place. But we were talking about a year ago, and he said, you know, it's really interesting. Of all the countries I've lived in, all of them had a generally shorthand called a, a national strategic agenda or a, a business plan for the country. You know, it was a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan. Some just fundamental goals. Now, you know, the, 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 the elected bodies d disagree about how to get there, but they at least had some, understand, you know, some common understanding of where you wanted to end up. We don't even have that in the United States. And Huntsman was like, my God, we don't, you know, think about it. We, can't even, we don't even have goals. And so if you don't have goals, how do you ever get anywhere? So part of what we're doing over the next couple of years is trying to, we have a process that we've been working on to establish some fundamental, simple goals for the country, and hopefully get that, we're spending a lot of time in New Hampshire and Iowa uh, trying to get that into the, the, the bloodstream so that uh, whoever is, is nominated for, the party, for their party's uh, politics, and we can talk about that too, because uh, this is going to be a fascinating election, uh, will buy into this notion that at least we should establish some goals, because once you get the goals, then you can start about the process of how you get there. That's all at uh, nolabels.org. I encourage you to look at it. Uh, and let me just say, part of the reason I love doing this sort of thing is that uh, I've seen in your generation uh, some really smart thinking in terms of sort of understanding what's going on out there. I, I, you are as a, I know it's these huge generalizations, but. Uh, I, I, this is, I'm generalizing because I've spent a lot of time with students over the last five years. And you are, uh, you are skeptical about uh, 
politics, but you're civically engaged, you want to make change, you want to fix things out there, but you, you have some skepticism about the traditional channels, the traditional ways of going about things, and so many of you are going through NGOs, through nonprofits, working, I mean, we, you can't imagine the sort of support we get from people like you at No Labels, and that's really where the energy is coming from. Bill Clinton, by the way, talks a lot about this, about how government is broken and the change is going to come from the nonprofits and the private sector, and, and, and you're very entrepreneurial, and so, uh, you know, I hope that you go into politics, but if you don't, I encourage you to go through other means, if it's not campaigns or government, to, to find other ways to affect, affect societal change, uh, and, and there's lots of examples out there. So, and the reason that I hope that that happens is because I, I'm not that hopeful about anything that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, the, you know, this election was a, it was, you know, it, 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 uh, it's not really a surprise. I mean, this, this, it's an off election, and the party uh, in, that doesn't hold the presidency almost always loses. Uh, this is very typical. It's rare when that doesn't happen uh, throughout our history. So the fact that Republicans won is not a big surprise. Uh, the question now is what does that mean for the next two years, and what does it mean for 2016? Um, you know, you would hope that sort of people get the message that, uh, that voters are, uh, you know, they, they want something done, and they do. And that's, that's again, when we see, see so much energy and no labels, people are saying, I don't care if it's a Democratic solution or a Republican solution. I just want some progress. I just want, you know, we have these big, big problems, and there's just been a failure to do anything uh, on these important issues. So, um, I, you know, the election night, everybody was sort of saying the right things, but that's kind of disintegrating already. And, uh, and I think immigration is probably a classic example of this. I think that, uh, I think that the president is going to use ex his executive authority uh, on this issue, uh, and I think the Republicans are going to balk, uh, and I have my own issues about that, uh, and I think it's going to be problematic for the Republicans long term, but I, that, so I, so on, on, <clears throat> there's some sort of small, well, I don't know if I can call it small ball, but there's some things like patent reform, uh, repealing the medical uh, device tax, trade promotion authority. Uh, also, I, th I think that the Republicans, because of the numbers that they have, are probably going to move on uh, Keystone. Uh, I think they're going to get a veto, and then I think they'll have the numbers to override the veto, because I think they'll have enough Democrats to override. Uh, so, I mean, so those are, those are some issues that I think that there could be some movement on, but otherwise I think that, I think there's going to be huge clashes. Uh, I, think that, I think that Boehner and McConnell are smart enough that they're not going to get into government shutdowns, uh, but I think that they're also uh, going to be pretty, uh, you know, I don't think that they're going to, they're going to yield on, on some of the big issues, and, and they feel like they've got the numbers. And so that what they're going to do is they're just going to send stuff to the president's desk, and it's going to be veto, 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 veto. I think that's what's going to happen. So the issue is, in, in, you know, a year or two from now, when the presidential elections are happening, is did people see the Republicans as putting forward meaningful legislation and the president stopped it, or were they just being obstructive, uh, being obstructionists? And uh, was Obama, so Obama, I think, will use his executive authority to pass immigration, I mean, to do immigration uh, move on immigration, to move on climate change, and uh, to move on Guantanamo Bay, which is, was one of his primary uh, issues when he ran. So, uh, but I think it's going to be a tough couple of years. Uh, I think there's going to be more gridlock. And then the question is, how does that unfold for 2016? I think there's a conventional wisdom for 2016 that... Uh, uh, that, you know, just given the, the, the demographics that uh, probably a Democrat's going to win, there's a lot to be said for that. Can you look at the historical patterns? On the other hand, this, this election showed some pretty surprising things, including millennials aren't just automatically pulling the levers for Democrats anymore because they're skeptical. They haven't, they, a lot of people have been disappointed over the last eight years, six years. Uh, so, and you've got a, 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 a likely nominee in Hillary Clinton who I think I think will, will you know who I think is uh, you know has earned it, uh, and I think that um, I, I think in many ways she could be a very good president. I think that she's got a Obama ran on change, and I think that her fundamental sort of message is going to be competence. 
you know, that she's been around long enough that she knows, you know, knows all the angles. She'll put people in, and it's true. I mean, she had legions of people that have worked for her or her husband that have been in and out of government, and so they're going to stock government with people who know the levers. And I think for a lot of people, that'll be a compelling message. On the other hand, it's a Clinton, you know, and that's going to rile up the Republican base. Although, interestingly, it could be a Bush-Clinton race. Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> uh, you know, I think that uh, there's a 50-50 shot that, that Jeb Bush will run. I think he's going to have a tough time in the primaries. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd love to see him nominated. Uh, I, and I think that, I think, uh, ironically, as much as people go, oh, my God, Bush-Clinton, I think it'd actually be a great race. I think it'd be very substantive. They're both very substantive, both policy wonks. Uh, I think, in a weird way, it'd be post-partisan. They've been, been through all the partisan fire, so that they're kind of past all that. Uh, but there's, the, I mean, he's going to have. A, I mean, the Republican primaries have, have moved so far right; it's going to be, it's going to be a buzzsaw, a, a real buzzsaw. Uh, so, if somebody's going to challenge uh, Hillary Clinton, and they're going to get a lot of attention. Uh, and you know, if I were a Democrat out there and Want to get a bunch of attention? I go run against Hillary Clinton because <laughs> there's going to be a moment where that person or people are going to have their moment. I mean, because why? Because reporters want conflict. They're not just going to write Hillary Clinton's won this election for six months, so they're going to give a lot of attention and credibility to whoever runs against her. And so, you know, somebody, I mean, somebody who doesn't mind being on the wrong side of Hillary Clinton is going to get a lot of attention. And, uh, but uh, but I think she's learned a lot in the last campaign, and I think they'll run a good campaign and. And so what's more interesting is to see whether, you know, Rand Paul is an interesting candidate in doing a lot of different things that Republicans haven't normally done. Uh, but there's a whole, the Republican field is wide open. That's what's interesting. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun to watch. I know we're running out of time, and we want to do some questions, so should we throw it open? that you could use to talk about climate change. Some people say it, some people yeah, don't. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the difference in the public perceptions of communism, or Soviet Union at that time, and public perceptions of, of climate change now? In other words, are those comparable kinds of phenomena, or is the relationship of the public to the, to the message, to the, the issue, a more complicated yeah, I think it's a little more complicated just because I think that while almost everybody recognized the threat of the Soviet Union, I don't think everybody recognizes the threat of climate change. Now, I think the Republicans are hurt by the current status quo on that, which is their answer is, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> well, I got asked about this today. I said, well, maybe, maybe these candidates aren't scientists, but maybe they could consult with some. <laughs> uh, and my point about that is that I think it would be better for Republicans to just acknowledge the, the basic science. And you, you have disagreements about sort of the bandwidth on that, but to, but to recognize the science and then just to say, you know, we agree on, on sort of the fundamental science, man-made uh, carbon emissions and, and, and its impact. Uh, but then you can say we, we just have a different policy and we don't, don't agree on the policy solutions uh, recommended by Democrats. And we don't believe it's that high a priority. We've got lots of other issues to deal with. I think that's a much better answer than just saying, I'm not a scientist, which I think makes the party look really backwards. But uh, So that, that's where I recommend. But, but I think that the, just the twist on that is that because of a very effective cl climate denial machine out there, there are a lot of Republicans that really don't believe it. And, and certainly, the machine has worked its way into the candidates so that they're afraid, especially in these primaries, to, to show too much leg on that. Obama's legacy is going to go down. Do you think it's going to be kind of like a lame duck presidency, or do you think there's some things that, looking back, will kind of note that we're big accomplishments? For sure, they will. You know, it's it's just it's I, I've seen this this before. Certainly for George W. Bush, you know, I mean, he was vilified during his presidency, and now I'm you know it's 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 not like he's I mean I mean he's looked on it's it's changed. I mean, the view of George W. Bush has changed pretty dramatically in a pretty short period of time. And I think the same will happen for Obama. I mean, just in the heat of the moment, things get so polarized uh, that I think, you know, five, ten years from now, people will look back on it very differently than they do today. Is a Democrat candidate 
for 2016, probably going to try to avoid his policy as much as possible. I mean, they that's the trick. Policy? That's the trick. You know, it's, I mean, that's... That, there's a lot, of, a lot of meetings going on right now among Democrats about you know, what happened in this election and what's happened to kind of the Democratic policy agenda and why hasn't that been more resonant with voters. Uh, you know, Obama said, vote on my policies, and they did, and they didn't like it. And so, uh, yeah, this, that's the trick for Hillary Clinton is how do you sort of distance yourself from that and at the same time do it diplomatically. And, and man, it's going to be a huge magnifying glass on every... Syllable that she utters about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. It's a really fine line. But I think, and, and again, she she can't say competence, you know, right? <laughs> but so they just have to find, you know, it'll be about experience probably than, than competence. But there'll be all kinds of kind of mojo about inflecting the idea of experience and competence in ways that are not seen as a direct jab at Obama. Um, I was hoping you could comment on uh, No Labels uh, doing some uh, get out the vote stuff against uh, Senator, Senator Udall of Colorado and sure. uh, kind of how that plays into uh, your uh, ability to work with the, especially the Democratic establishment in Washington. Yeah. yeah, great. So this is a really good example of kind of how politics works So and, and the rationale behind No Labels. So at No Labels, uh, as I said, we invited people from all political stripes to come into the room and work together because we think that's the most important thing. You have to just recognize that people have different ideologies and partisanships and, uh, and that the important thing is to get people in a room who are willing to work together. The most striking example of that in No Labels history in the last two years has been Cory Gardner. Signed up immediately, came to every meeting, worked with colleagues, worked across the demo, co-sponsored legislation. I mean, couldn't have been more enthusiastic about helping other Democrats, working with Democrats. Now, he's a conservative. He's a conservative, right? But that's not what we're about. We're not about, we, we said long ago, we're not just about you know, centrist politics because the Congress is divided. And if we're going to get any problems, we have to get people of different stripes together. So Mark Udall was a guy that we thought initially should be part of No Labels. We went to him and said, please come join. Nothing, 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 nothing ever. Just refused to participate. Wouldn't come to the meetings, wouldn't. And so we had what we call a seal of approval that we awarded to people who were members in good standing, agreed to this fundamental process of goals. Cory Gardner did all that. Mark Udall did none of it. So we supported Cory Gardner, went out and helped him, and Cory Gardner got elected. That made some Democrats mad and made it uncomfortable for Joe Manchin. And part of the problem for Joe Manchin was that, I mean, I, and I love Joe Manchin. He's been great for us and we've gone above and beyond the call of duty. But part of the problem was having an incumbent senator because he doesn't want to work against any, any members of Congress who are already there, which is, which is uh, I, I think, to be complimented. But, but, and that means Democrats or Republicans. So we had people we wanted to go out there and support that made it just difficult for Manchin. So Manchin decided to step down. He's still going to support us. He's just not the chair anymore. And uh, we announced this morning that Joe Lieberman is going to take his place. And Joe Lieberman is... And I've worked with him over the years. He's fantastic, and he perfectly represents the, the no labels DNA. And, and, as, uh, and because he's not an officer or not in the Senate, he won't have these kind of issues. Yep. Do you think there's any likelihood to the rumors that Biden would run in 2016? And if so, would he make a successful candidate? Um, you know, he goes to sleep every night wishing he was president, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that he ought to be. Uh, but he can't run against Hillary Clinton. You just can't do it. I mean, there's just too much overlap of constituencies, and it would just be seen as being unloyal. And so this, the only possibility is if her campaign melted down for some reason, and he'd be there in a shot. He would be there you know, nanoseconds later, because he really wants to run. He really thinks he should be president. And uh, you know, he's got, he's, you know, whatever you think about Joe Biden, I think he's pretty authentic. You know, I mean, he's kind of Joe, right? I mean, he's just kind of out there and says things that, that's kind of like George Bush, you know? I mean, the interesting thing, we do these focus groups with, about Kerry or Gore before that, and people would say, you know, I don't know about this, I don't know about that, but at the end of the day, you know, who do you want to have a beer with? George Bush, you know? They'd probably say the same thing about Joe Biden. You know, he's just a real guy, an authentic guy, and that authenticity is really important. So I think he'd be kind of a train wreck to watch. <laughs> <laughs> But it'd be pretty entertaining, and I think that'd be appealing to a lot of people. 
Yeah? Um, you had mentioned how the Media Environments Day impacts the way that counties are able to share the message. So I was wondering what role you think social media specifically has in the future of campaign communications? A ton, and, and I wish that I was more qualified to talk about it, but there's been already some analysis that, well, first of all, that there's going to be more money spent on social media next election than, than on television, which is a huge development, right? I mean, we've been kind of wondering when this was going to happen, we keep predicting, but it looks like that's actually going to happen. And, uh, you know, and there's a whole bunch of attention right now, and this is what I haven't read to specifically, but on what's happening with Facebook. Uh, and the Facebook's impact on sharing. And by the way, there was a really good article on that. By the way, that's another thing. This always happens when you're in the desert long enough. You figure out where the water is, right? And Republicans are starting to figure out where the water is on technology. And read the story that I think was in the Washington Post today or yesterday about Ed Gillespie's campaign in, uh, in Virginia. Uh, I, Ed Gillespie's just a, he's a, a terrific guy, uh, would be a great public servant. But really savvy too in terms of you know figuring out what to do, and he put together a great social media digital campaign and almost won you know he almost won that race in Virginia with with very little money. I mean because the Republican establishment just never thought it was possible that he could win, and on a shoestring, but a brilliant social media campaign almost won in a big upset. Yeah, um, you mentioned it briefly, but uh, you talked about the polarization, how it's moved into media. And so I was wondering, um, like this whole mission of like um, bipartisanship, um, like how that works when even the electorate is really getting, <coughs> excuse me, like absorbed into this idea of polarization. Well, uh, I mentioned that the media is complicit, and they are, uh, because they they thrive on conflict. And it's a huge problem. So just as an example, um, I guess it's ridiculous to say we're off the record, but uh, <laughs> but I'll just go ahead and say it. So, uh, well, I'll, 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 let me there are DP reporters in the room. Okay, so I was on television with a well-known uh, television personality talking about no labels, and we went to a break, and he turned to me and he said, "McKenna, can we just cut the bipartisan crap? Give me some red meat." And I was like, "Really?" You know, I mean, so that, that you know, they, they didn't want to talk about it because, it, you know, didn't create conflict, which is where they, they get their, their uh, they think they get their audience. So it's, it's you know, the, the responsible journalism is, is, is uh, there's not a lot of it. And, and in fact, the, I, I've been deal, I deal with it all the time. And it's just, I, I, you know, what's happening is that, you know, reporters are becoming advocates. And for sort of for one side or another, they're advocates just for conflict. They just want conflict. They don't want resolution. They don't want everybody getting together. That's not a good story. And so you just can't imagine the ways in which they feed that. And I, you know, I'm constantly trying to put out those fires, but they don't really care. Uh, so I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, you know, I hope that you know over time that that great institutions of reporting, or maybe some of these new ones like Vox or kind of these new enterprises. I mean, there's some interesting experiments going on in journalism, and hopefully that will, you know, over time, people be, will demand trusted sources, and, and maybe these, you know, maybe it's the New York Times, or maybe it's Fox, or maybe it's some of these people were really, I mean, there's some well-funded things that are happening, and uh, the Texas Tribune is a really good example of kind of an experiment uh, in journalism. So there's, there's, some, there's some things happening out there, but, but there's a lot of work to do. Maybe one more question. Here. Um, so you have, in your presentation, you had a very clear strategy for <coughs> messages for campaigns to you know, broader audiences. And you, know, you talk about making sure that campaigns are relevant to a particular audience. And I, I'm sort of wondering that in your No Labels project, you know, is there or are there ways that you take those kind of strategies and use it in order to talk across aisle? Like, how can you take some of the lessons from that messaging strategy and implement it in terms of appealing to people across a partisan divide? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's what we've been doing. And I think that that's why we've gotten such a strong response. And we've got 500,000 members in every district of the country. And I mean, there's just there, there's a huge appetite outside of Washington for this, this, this sort of message to bring the parties. And they want to problem solve. And so, I mean, that's a lot of what we learned about the messaging evolution of what we're doing. We don't talk so much, 
as, as I said, initially it was sort of this idea of representing the broad political middle. Well, you know, you talk to people about that. They say, well, you know, we're mobile now. People move and live by like-minded people politically in their communities. A lot have been written about this. Uh, so we realized that what we want to do is put a focus on problem solving. You know, we're not sort of for Democrats or Republicans. We're just about problem solving. And that has a huge resonance. And as soon as we started talking about problem solving and getting, getting away from kind of, you, know, you get 100 people in a room and say, what's the political middle? You'll get 100 different answers. And that just became a huge rabbit hole. And it just, you know, it, we just realized that, that was, we were going to waste a lot of time and energy trying to do that and said, let's just talk about problem solving. And once we kind of got onto that, it's like, boom. And it just lit up. And so that's, that's really been powerful for us. And, uh, you know, and, it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what the organization has done. And, uh, and I'm glad to have Joe Lieberman aboard now. He's going to be great. And John Huntsman's been great. And, and, and so, you know, it's, it's uh, I guess what I'd say is that, uh, you know, there's, there's a light in the tunnel, and uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and we're counting on you all to do it. So fix all the what we've left behind. Thank you. Oh, I, I said I'd tell my hat story, so I had to tell it real, real quick. So, so this, is a, this is the hat that my father had in his closet when I was growing up. I, there's not a picture of me growing up that I have a hat on. So. But this was, my, you know, it was a dad's closet. It had lots of neat stuff in it, but the most prized possession was this open road Stetson that sat on the top shelf, and I couldn't wait till I was old enough to have my own, and so I did. But this is a hat, this is a, it's, it's a gentleman's hat, and the difference, the reason why this is a gentleman hat, and the way, it, the, the style is that the brim is shorter. You know, most brims are like that deep. So this is kind of a gentleman's hat, and this is the hat that LBJ wore. It's also the hat that the, uh, uh, the uh, Texas Rangers wear. And the Texas Rangers, for those of you who don't know, is a, an elite security force that started back in the late 1800s. <clears throat> and I'll tell you a quick story. There was a, there was a riot down on the border, and the mayor and people were killing each other in the streets. They called the Texas Rangers to get down there, fixes this mayhem, people being murdered in the street. Train arrives the next day, the mayor goes to meet the, the Rangers, the door opens up, one Ranger walks out, and the mayor says, where's everybody else? And the Ranger says, one riot, one Ranger. <laughs> so these are cool dudes and dudettes. And, uh, but they're all like 6'4". They all look like Clint Eastwood. And it was Ann Richards' favorite thing about being governor uh, because there's a detail that protects the governor. And, and she'd just walk around with these just hunks, you know. <laughs> yeah. And just women swooning as they go by. Uh, so she was on a, uh, during her campaign for governor, she was on a, pl a small plane, and there was a bomb scare, and it was like a legitimate one. And so she's on a tarmac in like August in Texas, so it's already 100, it's probably 130 in the plane, because they can't leave the gen they have to turn it off. And so she's in there like cooking, and for about four hours, and then she, and you have to you know, imagine her voice telling this, which is so great. But she says she's in the back of the plane all sweating, and then she says a door to the plane opens, and a celestial shaft of life shines through. And then the six foot four Texas Ranger kind of leans in and says, Howdy, man. G.W. Hildebrand. <laughs> Texas Ranger. <laughs> I'm here to take you home and tuck you in. <laughs> she says all she could think about were her dirty pantyhose hanging on the shower at home <laughs> that he was going to see. Thank you all very much. <laughs>